to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven matthew chapter 19 verse number 14. welcome to our study of the truth series today as we think about the truth concerning abortion this is such a vitally important topic today to the church and in the United States of America and really worldwide because every day young innocent children are being put to death and we've labeled that as something that is not even life and yet God doesn't define it that way. As always we encourage you to visit our website if you're joining us for the first time today especially we encourage you to visit our website thegospelofchrist.com where you can find a host of Bible study materials available free of charge. You can access our videos or audio lessons, our transcripts. We also have Bible courses that are available online. Or if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, please you can visit our website and send in a media request form and we'd love to send you a free copy of today's lesson or any of the lessons that we have available. In the United States of America, our country was founded upon biblical principles. Andrew Jackson, one of the founding fathers of our country, once said, the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. The principles of God and Christianity were the foundation and were fundamental to the founding of the United States of America. Later, Ronald Reagan, one of our great presidents, said, Of the many influences that have shaped the United States into a distinctive nation and people, none may said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. And so we have a country that was founded on biblical principles, founded upon God and His Word and His truth, and yet we have a country that is also at war with God when it comes to abortion. January the 22nd, 1973, was a dark day in the United States of America. In the Roe v. Wade case, which legalized abortion, the definition was made. The word person as used in the 14th Amendment, does not include the unborn. And friends, since that time, 55 million babies have been aborted, lives have been lost, and untold harm has been done to children and women across this great United States of America. And so today we're thinking about what does God say? about the subject of abortion and how should we as Christians feel on a subject like this. Let's think about how inconsistent this is at first. I want to show you just the fact that in other areas we deem things valuable and yet sometimes we don't value human life like we ought to. For example, bald eagles and their eggs are protected by both state and federal laws. In fact, Violators face uh, penalties up to $25,000 or fines in prison between one and five years. In fact, if you break a bald eagle egg, you can get five years in prison. And yet, you can abort a human fetus and get governmental approval. Does that make sense? Now don't get me wrong, the bald eagle is a great symbol of American freedom and what the United States of America stands for. But a person can be fined $20,000 or get five years in prison for breaking a bald eagle egg and yet nothing is done if we abort a fetus. What's of more value? A bald eagle that doesn't have a soul 
or a human being that has a soul and that will one day live somewhere forever. And so we see the inconsistencies that often occur when we deal with things like this. As we think about the subject of abortion, let's realize that God and His Word must have the final say on this subject. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 that God is able to cast down the imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 verse 11 that Christians are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we are to expose or reprove those teachings. And so I've got to look to God's wisdom. I've got to stand behind what God says and never let our country shape what might be right or wrong. Well, let's begin by asking this question. Abortion. Is that just woman's right or is it murder? Are we talking about the the right of a woman who she could just choose to get rid of a baby or is that some heinous morally repulsive crime that we know of as murder. You know, our terminology is very critical when we think about this. Are we talking about a choice? Are we talking about women's rights? Are we talking about freedom when we deal with things like this? What's the real issue? The real issue is this. Is abortion the taking of innocent human life. Is a fetus, is a unborn child a human being? Do a few millimeters of skin separate one from being life and non-life, human and non-human? And when do the scriptures teach that human life actually begins? As we think about these ideas and as we think about some of the things related to uh, abortion and how we can know even from the earliest stages, whether it be seven or eight or ten weeks, you have a human body inside the womb where all body systems are present. At eight weeks old, you've got a baby that, that grips instruments that can suck its thumb. You look a little further at ten weeks you've got the structure of the human body that is completely formed even that young. 12 weeks old, it curls its toes, it makes a fist, it opens its mouth, and then on and on. As you look at the human body, it begins to develop, and from the very earliest days, it is a human. It shows the same signs that I show of life and and being human and not getting caught up in the evolutionary ideas that so many humanists want us to think of. And so from conception, a baby only develops and grows. All it needs is nourishment and time to become an adult. From the earliest stages, there's nothing that separates it from us today. Only just a few millimeters of skin. C.S. Lovett once said, aside from the moral issue, it has been my experience that abortion solves the problem with the least amount of bad side effect. Is that really true? The surgeon's scalpel removes the tissue, C.S. Lovett said, and God's forgiveness removes the guilt feelings. Is that really what the scriptures teach? Is it just mere tissue? Are are we talking about just something that is non-life, just skin? Is it a child or is it a choice? Is it something that we all have to deal with and think about? A baby can feel pain in the womb. That's been aptly shown through various studies. It's sensitive to touch, to light, to noise, and all the things that we face as well. But you know, the scientific evidence is really not what concerns us the most. What does the Bible say? When we think about the subject of abortion, we want to know Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, verse number 17. What does the scripture say? I want to offer a few passages to show that there is no distinction in the scripture between a fetus and a child. They are one and the same in the Bible. For example, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, of Mary it is said, she was with child. 
That same word child is also used to discuss a woman who had a baby who had not given birth yet. And so whether it be in the womb or whether it be born, it's the same word. There, there's no distinction made in Scripture for that. Another example, the word babe or brephos, Luke 1, leaped in her womb. Here we've got the example of John the Baptist and Jesus, Mary and Elizabeth, and the baby, same word used, leaped in her womb. Does that sound like non-life? Of course not. It was life. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothing. Luke chapter 2, verse number 12. Again, same Greek word, brephos, used to describe a woman who is pregnant with a child and an infant child. No difference made in the scripture, although we try to wait, make one in America, you don't find that in the Bible. Babe in the womb and out, the only difference is its location, size, and development. Friend, a few millimeters of skin does not separate life from non-life. Psalm 139 verses 13 through 16, the Bible says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now notice, David said, the psalmist said, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Does he sound like he's talking about non-life? David realized his life in the womb was the same out of. And so we cannot find that distinction made anywhere in the Scripture. Again, Psalm 139 Verses 13 through 16, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And so God was behind that process. Although He was made in secret, although that was not seen, it was still a human being or a person. David said, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book, they are all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. My substance, my days. David is speaking as an individual about his life inside the womb. And so there is no distinction made for that in Scripture. Now let me offer a couple of other passages that clearly show that abortion is indeed something that is wrong. I'll give you an example. If you have your Bible, you want to look to Exodus chapter 21. I believe this is the clearest example to show that God does not condone abortion and that life inside the womb is just as valuable as life outside the womb. Exodus 21, notice verses 22 through 25. The scripture says, if men fight and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows. He shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him. He shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, you shall give, watch this, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe. For strike. Now, you imagine the context in your mind. Let's say we've got two men who are angry at each other and they decide to, to fight. And this one man who's fighting with the other, his wife gets in the way and she gets punched in the stomach. What happens to that baby? Well, if the baby lives, then the judges could impose a fine on the man who hit her. But now notice this. If, when that woman was punched in the stomach, if she got hurt, if something happened to the baby, life for life. The life of that full-grown full grown adult male was to be forfeited for the life of that unborn child. Do you see, my friend, that it doesn't matter in God's sight whether it's in the womb or outside the womb? The life of a full-grown full grown adult male is just as important as the life of an unborn child in the eyes of God. That's why God says life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Whatever happens to one, the equivalent should happen to the other because there is no separation in the mind of God. Now, another passage, and this one's a little more unknown maybe. Amos 1 verse 13 says, Thus says the Lord, 
for three transgression of the people of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their territory. Now friend, as we think about this, here's what we ask you to consider. Is it a sin to have an abortion? Is that something that is a violation of God's will? Watch very carefully again. Amos 1 verse 13. For three transgressions, yes, and for four, God says, I'm bringing on my judgment on these people. And what did they do? They ripped open the women with children to enlarge their borders. What, did they, what were they doing there? They were basically causing their enemies women to abort their children so that their enemy wouldn't grow and they could grow. They were forcing abortions to enlarge their own size and decrease the size of their enemies. But regardless of the case, God called those abortions transgression or sin. Friend, when we talk about the taking of a life, whether that is inside the womb or whether that's outside, it is murder either way in the eyes of Almighty God. You know, when we think about the sanctity of human life and we think about how Christians can respond to this and how we can surely do good in our community, we need to realize that this is something God hates. God does not approve of, nor does He want babies to be killed. Listen to Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17. The last part of that, of all the things the Lord hates, the Bible says, the Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. In our news media lately, Planned Parenthood has come under attack for all the ungodly and heinous things they've been doing related to abortion and the things that go on with that. Videos have come out. That's been made known. Public outcry has increased. The governments of local states are getting involved, and rightly so. Look at the harm being done to innocent children. Look at the blood that's being shed. Just because maybe some man or some woman had a good time and found out they were pregnant and didn't want that baby, and so now let's put the baby to death. Well, is that really the state our country is at? Is that really where we are as a people, that we can't take the responsibility for our actions and thus abortion has become so popular with so many Christians today? And so as we think about these ideas, here are some things that every Christian for sure ought to realize. Number one, God Himself does not condone abortion. Abortion in the eyes of God is something that is absolutely not what God wants. God doesn't want Christians to take the life of an unborn child just like murder is wrong. If I were to go out on the street and shoot somebody, or if I were to go out on the street and kill somebody, that would be wrong. Well, friend, a little bit of skin doesn't separate life from non-life. Where did we get that idea? When did we decide? Roe v. Wade put it into action, but when did we decide that in the womb is different than out of the womb. Maybe it's because we've not seen it. Maybe it's because we, we, we haven't touched it. It's not tangible and we don't have to maybe think about it as much. Friend, that surely doesn't make it right in the sight of God. And so as a Christian, I first must realize this is not acceptable in the sight of our God. Secondly, as a child of God, I must do my part to teach and encourage others about the sanctity of every human life. Do we not realize that Genesis 2, 7 speaks directly to God's creation of man? The Lord God breathed in the man the breath of life. Man became a living soul. No difference in the womb and out of the womb. Matthew 1, 18, she was with child. Uh, an infant child later that had already been born, the same terminology is used regardless of if it's in the womb or not, that child has a spirit or soul that's been formed by God. That life is special and unique because it's made in the image of Almighty God. And we need to promote and to let people know the sanctity of every human being and its life. You know, I've been created and you've been created to honor and to glorify God to do everything possible with my life to lift up His name. That's why we're here. 
And part of that is to tell of His creation and how wonderful that is. Thirdly, as a child of God, I need to encourage people that abortion is not the best option. It's not an option at all. But friend, there are good options to think about. For example, let's say that a young couple uh, gets involved in a sexual relationship and, and that relationship produces a child and neither one of them are really ready. They should have thought that before, don't, don't get me wrong, but is abortion the only alternative? Friend, listen very carefully. Why not choose adoption every time over abortion? Now, as we've mentioned, first things first, accept responsibility for your actions. That's what people really need to do. Before I enter into sexual relations, it's only for a man and a wife, Hebrews 13, 4, but if someone violates God's law and entered into that, and then they're not ready for that. Friend, there's another alternative. There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of parents around this world who would be glad to adopt children. They're looking for, they're waiting for, they're longing for someone to give them a child. They may not can have them on their own. They may be medically or physically unable to do that, and yet what a great alternative that would be as a child of God. And then as Christians, we've been way too quiet in not letting our government, whether that be on a, a local, city, state, and national level, know how we feel. Other areas, the, the abortion activists, the homosexual movement, whatever it may be, they've been very vocal in what they've said and they've got that message out well and Christians we need to step up and be just as vocal and let people know how we feel we need to say what God says in the Bible on the subject of abortion that a life is a life whether it's in the womb or out of the womb that Christians need to honor and accept that fact and that our government is one day going to be responsible to Almighty God for its decisions. Our governmental leaders will stand before God and give an account for the decisions that they've made. And so as we look through the Bible, God's message about abortion is very plain and clear. Now, let's take that just a step further as it relates to the state and local and governmental level. Christians need, desperately need, to stand up and let their voices be heard when it comes to matters of voting. In Tennessee and other places, there have been uh, recently ballots, the provisions on the ballot, uh, promoting or not promoting, but doing away with some of the abortion laws, restricting those, peeling back some of that. And so as Christians, we need to vote against those ungodly measures. Vote that those things would not be accepted and would not be right in the sight of our God. Think about this. Put yourself in this situation. What if your parents had decided to have an abortion? How would that make you feel? Well, you wouldn't have experienced life, the joy of life, the sadness. You wouldn't have experienced that. You wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today. What if that were the case? We've got to kind of personalize this and not just see, see this in the abstract. This is personal. This is something that we each need to think about. And so God's message is very plain and clear that we do not at all need to let abortion be an issue that is unsettled. We need to stand up and let our voices be heard on these issues because every life is indeed important to Almighty God. Now, I want to mention one other thing related to this, and it's this. How does abortion affect women. You know, it's put off as though it's a woman's choice, it's woman's right, it's something that you can slip in and out and be done with and there'll be no consequences. Friend, I assure you from talking to people who've been in those situations, that's just not the case. The trauma, the heartache, the guilt, the sin that one feels, it's not an easy, in and out, take care of the situation to be done with it at all idea. The consequences of that, the guilt of it, stay with one for a very long time. If you're going to deal with that, why not go ahead and accept the responsibility? Stand up and take responsibility for your actions and don't let children be put to death over senseless things like these. And so remember, 
God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. As always, God's message about salvation, though, does indeed deal with the sin problem if one is willing to repent of it. Friend, we ask you today, have you, have you heard the message about Jesus and His plan of salvation? If so, are you willing to change your life and turn to Christ? Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Can someone who's never obeyed the gospel be forgiven of sin, even such sin as abortion? Absolutely. If they're willing to hear the gospel and, and repent of things in their life that are wrong, would you make the good confession that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God? Having made that confession, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Here's what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. On the great day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up for the very first time and proclaimed God's message of, of love and mercy and grace to a lost and dying world, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They got the message. For the Bible says they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who gladly received His Word that day were baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 40 through 42. And the Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. And so if one's never obeyed the gospel, why not do that? Why not take opportunity to have your sins washed away and become a Christian? And may each Christian stand firmly on God's truth that abortion is a sinful action that we must not participate in and that we absolutely must let our voices be heard on for the sake of human life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Reign on high forever with his bride. This is the gospel of We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.